Merci madame, je vais essayer d'être très bref et très concis. Trois questions. Euh, je vais poser euh, votre nom. Euh, Sénat Alouka, je viens du Togo, je travaille au l'ONG Jeune Volontaire pour l'Environnement, membre de la coalition africaine autour de la BAD. Euh, trois questions. La première, c'est poser euh, une corruption qui ne donne pas son nom. Euh, madame, euh, près de 115 selon une étude réalisée par la CDI, agent canadien du développement, près de 115 de cet agent retourne au Canada, de toute l'aide que le Canada envoie euh, à nos développement. Une seule compagnie norvégienne fait plus d'argent en Angola que tout l'argent que la Norvège donne en paquet au développement. Une seule compagnie en Angola, une compagnie norvégienne. C'est vrai que ce n'est pas la corruption. Oui, ils ont, ils ont respecté les contrats, ils ont donné ce qu'ils pouvaient donner à Angola. Mais madame, quel système mettre en place Je ne sais pas. Pour que nous puissions, est-ce qu'il faut aller à la Cour de justice Doivent-ils être des Angolais pour aller dans une cour norvégienne Comment faire pour que les entreprises installées chez nous puissent nous profiter Je dis que c'est une corruption qui ne donne pas son nom. Je ne sais pas si ça existe déjà dans le code de loi existant. Mais euh, j'aimerais juste renvoyer la question comme ça. Je ne sais pas si vous avez commencé à y réfléchir dans le cadre du partage des capitales des ressources. Deuxièmement, le, le, l la question de la médiation. Le ciel, mais monsieur, c'est vous trouvez ce matin. Euh, je, je crains que cette unité euh, n'ait pas suffisamment de, de moyens du moment où euh, elle est au sein de la banque. Je ne sais pas quelle est la meilleure façon, mais je crains un tout petit peu. Euh, je l'ai vu dans le cas de Bouja En 2008, euh, l'unité de médiation a fait une étude en Ouganda pour dire que le projet ne respecte pas les engagements de la BAD dans le sens de, de, de la compensation et du, euh, de la, du resettlement. Alors, euh, en 2012, l'unité est retournée et a vu que rien n'y a été fait. Et depuis, voilà, le projet avance. Euh, quelle arme dispose cette unité pour effectivement euh, être euh, une pesanteur quand il le faut Et puis, euh, je, je vais m'arrêter là-bas. Je vais vous mettre ici. Merci. On va ici. Merci, euh, Madame la modératrice. Je m'appelle euh, Saon Flon. Euh, je suis du REDA, REDA qui est le réseau pour l'environnement et le développement durable en Afrique, qui est hébergé par, qui est une ONG qui est hébergée par la Banque africaine de développement. Donc, euh, je voudrais profiter déjà du, du, du micro avant de venir à ma question, pour dire, pour dire merci à la Banque africaine de, de développement pour cet appui. Mais également aussi dire merci à la Banque africaine de développement qui associe euh, la société civile à, à, ce, à cet atelier. Parce que cela nous permet vraiment de comprendre et de voir tout ce qui est fait euh, par la Banque africaine de développement en matière de lutte contre euh, la corruption et aussi en matière aussi de, de diffusion euh, d'informations. Cela dit, euh, ce matin, dans les présentations, il y a eu le fait que, euh, la, dans les commentaires reçus par la banque, elle me l'a dit, que c'est d'accroître donc la participation de, de la société civile donc, euh, dans, dans ses activités. Et aussi, euh, parler aussi de la transparence et euh, de zéro corruption, cela va forcément avec la diffusion donc, de, de l'information. Et nous pensons, et je pense que, euh, la société civile a un, a un rôle à jouer dans, à ce niveau-là. Parce que quand nous parlons de diffusion euh, de formation, nous savons que la société civile elle est plus en contact donc, avec euh, le, le grassroots, avec donc, la, la, la population euh, des bases. Et donc, pour ceux qui n'ont pas accès à l'Internet, la, la société civile peut vraiment jouer ce rôle-là. Et euh, c'est pourquoi nous voulons euh, encourager euh, la Banque africaine, non seulement c'est déjà bien d'associer la société civile à ses activités à ce mais d'aller plus loin, d'aller plus loin en intégrant effectivement la société civile donc, dans, son, dans, son, dans ce mécanisme. Euh, oui, ça c'était euh, ma question. Donc, un commentaire aussi. Merci. Yes, you get you and then you. Oui, et puis avec euh, Merci. J'ai des petites questions à poser. Je commence d'abord par le Ghana. Je crois qu'il est le gouvernement ghanéen, c'est ça. Vous êtes monsieur Ah, pardon. Ouattara Diakalia, la société civile Côte d'Ivoire. Le Ghana est cité comme pays modèle en matière de gouvernance. Ça, c'est indéniable. Et je voudrais lui demander quel est le degré d'implication de la société civile au côté du gouvernement dans la lutte contre la corruption. 
de comment ça se fait. Monsieur de Libéria, euh, la Côte d'Ivoire a une situation post-crise et l'exemple de Libéria, Libéria m'inspire. Il a dit dans son exposé que grâce à la magnanimité de Serge Johnson, euh, le pays retrouve ses. Enfin, comment ça passe, l'heure de noblesse et surtout en matière de corruption. Je voudrais des exemples précis. Parce qu'on sait que généralement dans nos pays, nos présidents sont toujours des prophètes. Donc je voudrais concrètement, qu'est-ce qu'elle a fait, quels sont les actes qu'elle a posés pour lutter contre la corruption et pour la cité en exemple. Je ne dis pas que la cité en exemple est une mauvaise chose. Bien, euh, la question qui suit, c'est aux deux, aux deux dans, enfin, la vice-présidente et chose. Bien, euh, Chose. Excusez, je ne dis pas chose. En fait, il dit chose, je ne m'adresse pas au vous, s'il vous plaît. Excusez-moi. Que... Voilà. Bien. De plus en plus, tous nos gouvernements traduisent cette volonté de traiter la corruption. Comment euh, la banque entend accompagner nos pays dans ce périlleux, ou bien dans cette périlleuse aventure Ensuite, la même question au lieu de matin, elle a dit que 10% l'argent partait et supérieur à l'aide publique au développement. Et dans les justificatifs, euh, Madame la représentante du Ghana, euh, Bad Ghana disait que ce n'est pas de la corruption, mais c'est plus lié à l'incapacité ou l'incompétence de nos dirigeants en matière de négociation. Je ne suis pas d'accord avec elle. Et là, moi je pense que en termes de ressources humaines, nous avons suffisamment de ressources humaines dans nos États. Mais c'est plus à des pesanteurs politiques. Et ce phénomène de sous-table, il ne faut pas occulter. Moi, je pense que c'est lié à ces deux-là. Et enfin, pour terminer, en termes de transparence, je sais que la banque n'est pas dotée d'un pouvoir coercitif. Alors, quand vous découvrez des cas de mauvaise gestion, de gestion opaque, comment vous faites pour traquer ces genres de cas, que ce soit le gouvernement ou au niveau de la société Merci. D'accord. Merci. Je suis Patrick Mouroua, coordonnateur de la et pardon, président du conseil d'administration de la Convention de la société civile ivoirienne. Euh, deux petites euh, préoccupations. La première ce matin. La BAD a montré qu'elle soutenait le secteur privé. Mmh. Moi, j'ai été toujours inquiet de ce soutien sans calcul de la BAD au secteur privé. Parce que le secteur privé en Afrique n'est pas toujours maîtrisé par les nationaux africains. C'est l'une des raisons pour lesquelles nous avons un taux de croissance élevé et le taux de pauvreté également élevé. Parce que le, la création de richesses est faite à partir d'un mode de production dominé par l'étranger. Donc, le résultat de la croissance va à l'étranger, ça, ça, ça n'impacte pas la vie des citoyens. Donc, je voudrais que la BAD, à chaque fois, essaie de voir comment exiger que des nationaux puissent être partie prenante dans la création des richesses. Deuxième inquiétude, c'est la question des industries extractives. Il y a à peu près huit mois, au Congrès des économistes africains, j'ai eu l'honneur de faire une communication pour montrer que les industries extractives au niveau de la CDAO concurrencent, combattent et tuent les industries de transformation, l'industrie manufacturière qui en réalité développe l'Afrique. Les industries extractives ont un impact négatif sur le développement industriel de l'Afrique. Je peux vous donner ma communication après. Voilà. Alors quand la BAD se met à soutenir le secteur privé, au niveau des industries extractives, je me demande si la banque ne contribue pas à faire reculer l'industrie manufacturière qui est création des richesses. Je termine, madame. Je termine. Au niveau de la transparence, une proposition concrète que nous avons faite au niveau de la Convention de la Société Civile Ivoirienne, qui consiste à renforcer les institutions pour que le Parlement, le Conseil économique et social, je ne parle même pas de la société civile, comme il y a même sur la société civile, pour que les institutions nationales puissent comprendre les contrats pétroliers et miniers, 
dans la plupart des pays africains, ça se passe entre le ministre des Mines et de l'Énergie et le président de la République et les multinationales. Même les autres membres du gouvernement sont même pas informés des contrats miniers et pétroliers, à plus fort de la société civile. Donc ça, c'est un problème sérieux. Je voudrais que la BAD exige que tout le gouvernement et le Parlement et les institutions, notamment le Conseil économique et social, puissent être informés des contenus des contrats miniers et pétroliers avant même d'arriver à la société civile. Que ce ne soit pas un deal entre le ministre des Mines et du Pétrole, le président et les multinationales. Merci. What is the uh, suivi? What is the uh, suivi? The, no, the follow-up, you, know, uh, uh, you know. So what do we do with this information that we get? Mike, you're going to tell us about that, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> and then, Samuel um, uh, uh, from Liberia talked about the problem that, uh, it's not a problem that, you know, civil society organizations, we should be the watchdogs, okay. right? We should be the watchdogs and to make sure that the projects, the projects are going on as they should. But again, there's the issue of getting that information. As civil society organizations, they do not get the information. They, they, they're not civil. I mean, they go maybe to the Ministry of Planning or whatever, you know, and ask for the information. They are not, they're not told no, but they're given the old run around, so they'll never get the information. What do you think about that? You know, that's also a question, you know. Uh, then, of course, there were the questions about corruption. Uh, a specific question to you, Kuleshna, was that what concretely did uh, Madame Sirleaf, what did she do? What are the measures that she's taken or she took with regards to corruption? So they want to know specifically what it is that, 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 she, that, she, that she did. Um, Mr. Sekutori, now they asked you a question whilst you were not here. Do you have enough resources? Do you have enough resources? <laughs> you are within the bank, but do you have enough resources to do all the work that you are saying? And I'm sure you're going to be talking more about it tomorrow. But just a quick maybe answer about the resources uh, that, that they, 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 they're asking you about. Again, 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 keep resolving the information. You keep having the same thing. This information, yes, we have it, but it is not. So it means to say that they're, they're not quite satisfied with the, the fact that we say, okay, we can give the information that you go to that. We need to speak a little bit more about what kind, how we can really communicate. The communication is, is, is a big thing. Um, Mr. Watara, you want to know how the uh, civil society organizations work in Ghana. So he was talking to you, Mr. Sawyer, how the civil society uh, um, Work on Ghana. And to Marie Lawrence, to Cecilia, he say, he say that, you know, he does not really agree that it is incompetence or, or it's uh, uh, mis mis mismanagement. He doesn't really agree with that. So maybe you can tell him what, you, either you convince him that it is, or you tell us what it is about, you know. Um, transparency, we talked about transparency. Uh, what do you do with CS, civil society organizations? You yourselves need to be transparent in the things that, that, that you do. How do we, as a bank, monitor things like that? You know, um, Patrick is not very happy with us at all. Patrick is not happy with us. He's saying that, you know, uh, we, 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 we support this private sector. Right? He's not happy with that. We support the private sector. But he's worried because the private sector is really dominated by foreigners. You know, it's dominated by foreigners. And how does the, the, the bad, how do we ensure that, uh, uh, you know, the, about the negative, I can call it the negative impact on the extractive industry? So let's make him happy. Okay, let's make him happy. Uh, if uh, in, in the course of, in the course of, the, of your responses, we may have some other uh, questions that will come up. So who would like to start? <laughs> Commissioner. Oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> No, they listen to the questions and the comments across the across the floor. 
You know, I'm in sympathy with my colleagues from the civil society. Before I came to government two years ago, I spent 12 years of my life in civil society. As a matter of fact, uh, I was head of the Justice and Peace Commission for six years of my life. And uh, I was involved with issues of this nature, that uh, the barrier between policy makers and civil society. So when coolies are raising these kind of issues, I mean, deep sympathy with them. But to my sister from Liberia, I know for sure when these kind of laws and measures are put into place, there will always be a barrier to them. Look, people will not change overnight, but they will be made, they can be made to change. And one of the things I encourage my colleagues in civil society in Liberia is to challenge the law. If you invoke the Freedom of Information Act to seek information, and that information is denied you, there is mechanism to seek redress. But if you are, if you are, if you, the people do respond to you, and you go in your closet, you lay down, oh, they will continue. You got to challenge the law and force them to compliance. So I know there will be challenges, and people are determined to serve obstacles to this kind of thing. You know, reform is a is a difficult thing. It takes people with liberal mind to adapt to reform easily. There will always be obstacles. If, the, if those obstacles are created artificially, the thing that is incumbent upon you or the civil society is to challenge that law in the code of law. I mean, so I want to encourage you. I know, I know there are obstacles. I know. I'm, I'm aware of that. That people do not want to conform to these reform laws that are being made. They will always put the bottom next year, Yana. But hey, you got to stand tall. As to the, I mean, the performance of the African Development Bank in my country, the African Development Bank is trying to pave a major role in the southeastern part of my country, that it becomes accessible, in, inaccessible during the reading season. But again, how much is information coming up to let people know what African Development Bank is doing? I mean, if that, if that project is complete, hey, it would be a major boost to the economic viability of that, of that area. So the bank needs to do a little bit more. In constructing that road, of course, people will be affected. People's farmlands will be affected. People's traditional strands and everything will be affected. So that information needs to come up. First, this is what will happen. This will be the override benefit to the community and to Liberia as a whole. So a little bit more needs to be done uh, information sharing. My friend from Cote d'Ivoire who want to know uh, concrete examples of what Mr. Sely is doing. Yeah, I share your concern. Uh, your country is a, is a post-conflict country in Lebanon. It's just that uh, my own got through a little bit more, I mean, earlier than yours. But all of us have the same problem. But to, uh, to me, the fact that Mr. Sely has developed the political will to put into place this kind of these systems I'm talking about. It shows commitment. If she doesn't mean it in your inner self, I can't say so. Because I do not know why it's in your inner self. I can only speak to what I can see basically. The fact that she has created a commission to deal with the issue of corruption, I think she means it. The fact that she has put into place a procurement commission, right now the budget period has just finished now, the budget has been passed for the next fiscal year. If you pick up the newspapers on a daily basis, every government purchasing agency is now calling, they pull up a bid for companies to bid for the kind of procurement they want to do. Before, that was not, a, that was not the case. A minister could get out here, a procurement officer could go and make millions of dollars, I mean dollars a procurement, without throwing out a bid to, I mean, to select the suitable I mean, a, a, a supplier. So I think with all these kind of systems you are created in concrete terms, what she means. Or no, I know for sure something that is lacking in my country is the level at which we should be prosecuting people who are caught in corrupt practices. That system is slow. It shows, it sometimes shows that uh, corruption is overriding and Madame does not have the political will. But as somebody who is practically involved with the system, as a lawyer myself who I practiced law before I came to government, our judicial system is in serious crisis. Serious crisis. Again, it can be attributed to the war. We had real dream coming from the country. Our I mean, court system was all wrecked. 
So it takes time to rebuild it and build confidence. But if you talk about concrete terms, yes, you are demonstrated concrete terms, as evidenced by the kind of uh, anti-corruption institutions that our government have instituted. They say, where we want to be as a country, as a nation, I can be the first to say no. We get more to do, and gradually we are moving. Yes, thank you. I think our colleague from I will go the one with the one who asked. Yes, uh, I'm not sure whether what he said was what he was looking for. I think he was asking for government collaboration with civil societies. Am I right? Yes, yes, yes. In that regard, I can say that in the first place, I want to uh, applaud you for recognizing the fact that Ghana is a model for good governance. We are grateful for that recommendation. And then to say that government is doing a lot. I mean, the fact that civil societies are able to thrive in this country shows the conducive environment in which the, the government has created for them to thrive. And then secondly, government allows Duma funds to be assessed by civil societies. I'm sure some of the civil societies that are here have access to funds provided to the UN or the EU for their activities. And then thirdly, virtually all stakeholder consultation that will take place in this country now involves civil society, even when it comes to bills to parliament. So that they have a very strong input into what the final shape of the law, the bill looks like. And then finally, I would say that civil societies are also given an opportunity by government to monitor projects and programs being implemented by the various developing partners. In fact, I can cite the example of SEN, which is sometimes given some assignments to monitor the impact of some programs that are implemented by, for example, the World Bank. So in short, the government is collaborating seriously with civil society in Ghana. It may not be to the satisfaction of civil society, but I think we are doing quite well. Maybe for the vast majority of the people here, uh, uh, they, they have no clue what that issue was. Uh, Bujagali, there were two projects ongoing in, in, in Uganda. The hydropower, essentially for uh, uh, generation of uh, uh, hydroelectricity, and then the transmission lines. Those two projects that were, uh, I mean, they are linked, of course, but two, two separate projects. And, uh, and uh, uh, we received, my office received a complaint uh, my recollection is it was in May 2006. Uh, and then hopefully by the end of tomorrow, you will see the kind of methodology we follow when we receive a request like that. Right? So I'm not going to go into that detail. Uh, clearly, uh, a number of issues were raised by those who contacted us, a whole range of issues. And hydro, hydro power dams have always been like that traditionally in the first place. Uh, issues range from resettlement issues to uh, uh, the fact that if you are building a dam, you are going to have an impact on cultural heritage in, in the area that uh, you may uh, create some uh, issues for the downstream uh, population in terms of water resources, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a, a whole range of uh, issues that, that they raised. Uh, obviously, we followed our procedures and there took a mission, and there was an assessment that was done. By the way, uh, uh, you know, the African Development Bank was not the only development bank involved in Bujagali, uh, and you know, the World Bank also received a complaint on, on, on the dam. So we, we did the work that was required, and, uh, and uh, four missions were under, undertaken by my, my, my experts to go, go out in the field to try to see uh, how we can address the issue. And then we have a protocol with management at your bank. A complaint comes, and then management is supposed to provide some answers in terms of what they intend to do to address those issues. And they go out and work with the project implementation units to make sure that those issues have, have been addressed. So from 2006 up until now, we are still on, on the case. 
four missions undertaken, a lot of issues resolved. The only pending issue that is there is uh, essentially the issue of resettlement. But this is out, out, I can say it's out of the hands of ADB. Because it's the people themselves that decided instead of remaining engaged in our negotiation process, because we are involved, I told you the World Bank and IFC are also involved from the private sector side, they decided to take some of the, uh, the issues to court on the resettlement. Once you do that, then the courts have to take their own course, and only God knows. So hopefully, I think, you know, from the bank side, you know, most of the things have been complied with. We will have closed the project now, but we couldn't because uh, uh, there were some savings that, were, that <laughs> were made on the initial investment from, you know, uh, the bank and also from JICA. Uh, they wanted to upgrade, uh, use that uh, savings to upgrade uh, the switch, switch yard from, I think, 130 kV to about 230 uh, kV. So that project is, is ongoing. So the savings has helped the government upgrade uh, you know, the, the facility, and then we have to postpone now the, cl the closing of the case. So for those of you uh, worried about Bujagali, I think things are under control. Coming back to the broader issue of uh, uh, CRMU, we'll discuss it tomorrow. You see, your business, I mean, you know, we're talk talking about business here. See, your resources have to be linked to your business. Up until today, the bank has invested significant amount of resources in this unit to establish it, to make sure that we have uh, you know, the, the, the personnel, the experts that are sitting there to do the investigations for us. In terms of resources, we have no, no, no problem. The only difficulty we have, and I, you can understand that, you see, these kind of recourse systems work only when people come and use them when people know that they, they are there, when people have confidence that if they come, their issues can be addressed, or if they have a culture of going to recourse systems. And we you know our environment is slightly different. But there is also some competition. This is why tomorrow you will hear from my colleague from the World Bank, the inspection panel. What happens in Africa also, we are not the only uh, 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 development bank. You have the World Bank, you have the European Investment Bank, and et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes a lot of cases go to those entities as well instead of coming, coming to ADB. So we have enough resources to do our job. So in case there is an increase in, 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 in our business, I'm sure the bank is prepared to just provide the necessary resources. And then, of course, tomorrow... We'll have a, a little... Uh, I will give you, you know, plenty of details, and, and I will make the session very interactive. All right. I think I, um, I was uh, directly uh, challenged in you know, the comment that I made this, uh, this morning, but, but it so happened that I think the final statement from uh, the gentleman from Côte d'Ivoire seemed to somehow agree with my original statement. I think the statement I made this morning was that uh, um, a recent report that we, I think we partner with, uh, is it IF? F or G A I uh, IFF, IFF International, uh, International Financial yes. Integrity, or I mean, very well, you know, um, recognize a, a company that does studies like this on precisely financial flows uh, between countries. And if I recall well, the conclusion from that study, um, the conclusion was that a lot of the flows, the illicit financial flows that we see all over the continent, are not necessarily, or at least you cannot point to specific corruption cases where the cases that we are aware of are transfers into bank accounts, into all these tax havens, etc. As a matter of fact, the study that they did showed that when you look at some of the contracts, I think the gentleman may need uh, to be... I think it's his, it's him, it's no? It's his question, yeah. So the, 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 what we were trying to, what the study showed is that when you look at the transfer, the bulk of the transfers have to do with the transfer from multinational companies back to their headquarters. And a lot of these transfers have to do with, um, I believe, a lot of creativity in what they call inter-companies 
pricing, for example, yeah. policies. A lot of this has to do also with uh, creative accounting yeah. on how you declare or you do not declare profits or how you attribute losses to the country where the tax, reg or the, the tax regime is least favorable. And these are the ways through which basically you have a number of what is called illicit transfer. And it is illicit because if you apply the laws of the countries, if you apply all the, uh, the, the regulation in the country, if you do not have, um, I would still say it, if you do not have creative accountant, lawyers who really know how to go around these rules, you will not be able to get away with that. And this is why I said that unfortunately, um, of, of, of fortune, or, of, or fortunately, because some countries are now dedicating resources to that, unfortunately, we do not necessarily have that experience available in the civil service. Because it's also important to mention that. You really need a specific expertise, and I agree with him. You also need to give the opportunity to these experts to do their work. And this is why I say that his last statement sort of agrees with me when he says that a lot of these contracts are negotiated between two or three individuals. And they totally fall off the normal um, you know, a due diligence process that should normally take place. So that the country truly looks at value for money. What is the country getting into this contract? So I think that we, 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 I'm sure that we can, we can find a middle ground where we can agree uh, uh, for each position. Exactly. Um, in, in, within the same context, I, I should also mention there's the African Legal Support Facility, mm -hmm. which is um, being hosted by the African Development Bank. We are one of the founders. And the African Legal Support Facility is actually addressing this issue of lack of capacity, which we have seen that in the negotiation of natural resource management contracts, there's, it's clearly not a level playing field. The understanding of how you negotiate those contracts, to a large extent, um, the capacity is deficient on the continent. And so we're, the, the African Legal Support Facility, what it does, is they actually will secure that capacity for countries that are in negotiations and ensure that they have the right team to assist them um, with the negotiations. The capacity is expensive, and so what they try to do is make sure that they can first identify the right um, team and put together the right team for governments and also assist with the financing. And so this is what um, is being done in that respect. And, and you know, a lot of times when we're thinking about negotiating natural resource management contracts, we think it's purely an issue of lawyers. And this is where we miss it. You go in, and, and I, I used to um, practice as a lawyer. And you will go in, and on one side you see lawyers, but on the other side, you see lawyers, investment bankers, Finance. loads of number con tax, crunchers, tax, ex tax ex experts, okay. accountants, they're they all there. Now, the lawyers' room to maneuver is determined by all of those people. And they are looking at profits, they're looking at the investments they're going to make in the country. They're looking at all of that as they negotiate. And to a large extent, some, some of our countries are newer in, in, in the business, and, and so that depth of capacity is not existent. Also, if you look at our educational systems, we, we talked about making sure that we're developing skills that are fit for purpose. A lot of our law schools, a lot of our universities, where yes, we, we, we are having good lawyers being called to the bar. But these good lawyers are not necessarily actually studying project finance, oil and gas law, um, issues of tax. They're not necessarily focusing on that. And so, great lawyer has graduated with a first class, 
maybe is a great barrister, but negotiating an oil and gas contract is a lot more than that. And so we need, it, it's not always about corruption in those issues. To a large extent, it's capacity. Um, also, and, and this is why, as an institution, we have decided to create a natural resource management center. Because it is clearly, if we get it right with natural resource management, we will contribute greatly to the transformation of this continent. We will contribute greatly to making sure that our extractive industries also will lead to value added being provided within the, within the country and not just extract and ship out. And, and so the, this is, these are areas that we're looking at. It's a new thing for the African Development Bank and you will be hearing more of what um, we will be doing with that context. Also on the issue of capacity, I, I, you know, there was this issue of procurement and how do we deal with the issue that, particularly when it comes to international competitive bidding, that the bidders that tend to win are not African countries? And are we doing anything about it? And we are looking at that issue as an institution. Um, we're focusing on, we're looking, it's actually a, a major review of our procurement rules. And a major review on actually how we package the procurement bids. Are we packaging them that they're too large, that there isn't local capacity? Are we encouraging, in, in our procurement um, rules, are we encouraging collaborations between international um, companies as well as local companies? Are we requiring that there should be some national procurement? Are we requiring in our contracts that there should be knowledge transfer built in and being monitored accurately. And so these are the issues that we're now looking at because we know that procurement is actually a means of developing the private sector, the indigenous private sector, and a means of driving development. So these are issues we're very conscious of and, and these are issues we're looking at. And, and this um, takes me directly to developing the indigenous African private sector, and, and, and it's important. But, you know, this morning I was talking about how we're trying to reach micro, small, and medium enterprises, because it's actually within that band that you find the local or the indigenous entrepreneurs. And so we, we are actively trying to reach them with financing, so developing a different type of financing instrument that we have that will be targeted at, I would say, the higher level corporation. But now coming up with instruments that are reaching to the informal sector, reaching to small enterprises, providing them financing. We, managing that sort of, um, those types of transactions, the resources are huge. So we can't do it alone. So we've had to partner with local financial institutions in the countries. So we, we just um, had a board approve what we call a small and medium enterprises program. And we've had um, two lines of credits actually being provided to small financial institutions in African countries. And we have identified that these are the financial institutions that are actually working with a small and medium enterprises, and that through them we can reach those enterprises. Now, you know, I talked about development requiring you to take risks. Usually, those financial institutions will not meet our standards. And so we will not necessarily be able to work with them, you know, when we do our due diligence and, and look at their risk and look at it from our own risk framework. But what we've looked at is, so these financial institutions, they're, in the, they're, in the great, they're doing great business, but they have serious capacity issues. So we're providing capacity resources to actually help them address their capacity issues. We're providing the right collaboration for those financial institutions to help develop their risk management framework. And, and to help deal with their internal issues. But at the same time, we're doing business with them. And, and this is the only way 
that we can actually reach that band where you have indigenous um, African private sector. Is there anything else? I, I think. I think he was uh, yes. he was also worried about uh, the banks uh, scaling up of its lending to the private sector yeah. because he believes that it is. Uh, now, it is. scaling up of our lending to the private sector, mm. there, there are no, I mean, we have to scale up our financing um, transactions. We, we have to scale up our volumes. We have to scale up the scope. And this is both for public sector and private sector. There's, and and when, when, we address, when, when we go into transactions with the public sector, we're going into transactions in areas where government is best fit to actually be our partner. But we cannot go into areas where it really should be private sector. We're putting the continent back in the dark ages. You know, government now is focusing on certain areas and they are creating the enabling environment for private sector to take up their own responsibilities because government does not want to be the player in private sector any longer. And we respect that. And so as you see us increasing what we're doing in the private sector, it is from that, it, that is the logic informing what we're doing with the private sector. And there's no way you can reach um, the SMEs. You know what's interesting is each year on this continent, we have 15 million new people coming into the market looking for jobs. If you don't develop the private sector, you're going to have a major problem because government cannot employ those people. And that's why we're actively um, going into private sector also. Thank you very much. I think it's Thank you. The, at, at the beginning, you mentioned the, is David Hutton, uh, the RFI. Uh, you mentioned the role of the AFDP uh, in promoting good governance through the disclosure and access. Now, uh, countries like Egypt and Libya, which you mentioned, and Tunisia, have been going through a lot of political turmoil these days. And uh, you mentioned a review of your credit policies. Now, they have a lot of history of uh, civil societies which are apparently causing a lot of confusion. Now, do you hope to review the credit policy to these countries like Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia, who have gone through a very strict um, turmoil in governance lately, in terms of credit availability and access disclosure? This is my question. Are they going to be, still be members of the oh, ADB? Oh, oh. And uh, how do you see the ADB trying to control their governance in these systems. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the lady in white, madame, yes. Je suis madame Chasse madame Maïga, la République du Mali. Je travaille à la direction générale de la dette publique. J'ai juste deux préoccupations. C'est par rapport au système d'accès à l'information Il est un nouveau produit que la banque est en train de, 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 de mettre ce, à la disposition des de bénéficiaires de projets financés par la banque. C'est toujours par rapport au processus d'approbation de, de ce nouveau produit. Information qui, les informations qui seront limitées, quelles sont les, les, les procédures que la banque entend mettre en place pour vraiment faire approuver ces informations par le gouvernement et quel département sera vraiment habilité à cette approbation parce qu'il il, il, il est quand même bon de connaître que et, nos projets concernent divers, divers secteurs et si l'information n'est pas vraiment adressée au département approprié ici C'est ce département qui va l'approuver pour être divisé, pour être mis sur, le, pour être mis sur euh, Internet et avoir et être accès à tout le monde. Il faut connaître que c'est vraiment un problème qu'on va chercher à, à, à gérer. L'information, c'est vraiment un moyen de lutte contre la corruption, mais aussi quand elle est mal donnée, on peut être une source de corruption. Tout à fait. Ça, c'est ma première préoccupation. La deuxième préoccupation, c'est toujours par rapport à la corruption. Je crois que la banque fait de vraiment des efforts 
redouable dans ce sens. Mais je crois qu'il est surtout bon de voir l'évaluation de nos projets. C'est depuis à l'évaluation de nos projets que ce, ce système, cette, ce mal est engrené dans nos projets. Par exemple, un projet qui est évalué et mal évalué va durer en longueur dans le temps. Et c'est ce qui est le plus souvent la production de l'économie. Merci. Merci. Je vais essayer de répondre. Ok, c'est correct. Je vais essayer de répondre. 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 So membership and as well as a mandate, that is totally um, separate from the review of the business uh, model. The membership, first, we are membership, we have both African and non-African countries, and suspension from membership is not based on credit standing. Uh, and, and so I, I should mention that you may not be able to increase your shares as a member if you cannot pay for those shares, but it will not be the basis of being um, suspended from membership um, of the institution. So what we're looking at is actually how to make more resources available to low-income countries. This is, this is really um, the focus, and also how do we diversify our client base as an institution. Because it's impossible, I mean, it's important from a risk management perspective to actually have a diversified client base. And so these are two of our objectives. How do we deliver on our mandate more eff effectively by reaching out and provide and scaling up what we're doing in low income Africa? And then how do we also um, make sure that we have a diversified client base. And when we're talking about a diversified client base, it is making sure that truly as Africa's premier development finance institution, we are relevant in every single African country. Now that relevance can be through financial resources and or actually can be through knowledge products. But the key thing is having a real partnership for development with every African country. Um, on, on the, the issues raised by um, a, a participant from the government of Mali, you've raised very important issues. You know, in our relationship with countries, every country at the time of membership designates uh, a point focal, a focal point, <laughs> a, a, a focal point um, for all engagement with the country. So it could be the Ministry of Finance, it could be um, the Ministry of Economic Planning, if it's a separate ministry, or the Ministry of International um, Development and Cooperation. Now, when we're trying to get um, the, the consent to actually um, disclose certain information, even though the project may be in a different sector, we will always work through that focal point, the ministry that has been designated, now that ministry, we will be working through that ministry to make sure that we reach out to all the players involved in that project internally to ensure that also government is taking a rational, fully informed decision. Because you can have a, a decision that is not informed. But what we will do is we will always go through that focal point. So, and, and that focal point is usually the office of the governor uh, the, the, that's the person that's on the Board of Governors of the African Development Bank. And it will be facilitated by the ADB desk officer. So we will not, you know, all of this will not be outside of the channels that have been um, set up for our engagement with, with every country. Mm -hmm. um, I hope I've covered it. You covered it. Okay. Yeah. Covered it. Mm -hmm. okay. So you want to know about the valuation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. On, yeah. No, this is what I said that it, it's on North Africa, it, it's not about suspending, reducing, um, 
re resources that we're making available or in any way reducing our engagement or our relevance to those clients. Um, that that, that um, is not the intention. The issues about quality at entry um, that, um, uh, that was raised, it is critical for us. And um, we are focusing on actually strengthening our quality at, at ed entry capacity because we know that if you miss it in the design of the project, that is going to burden the project all through. And so we've developed what we'll call readiness reviews before a project is actually put through the system for approval. You have to clear those readiness reviews to make sure that the quality at entry is actually of good quality before we take it um, to uh, take it for approval processes. So you've raised a very important issue, and it's an issue we are addressing. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, just, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Sida was saying, saying disclosure. Yeah. I think the World Bank model may be what the AFDB may also emulate. Mm -hmm. In their financing agreement that yeah. the government signs, yeah. that clause is incentive, the, yeah. which you have to sign on to. And yeah. as soon as the agreement is signed, yeah. the closure becomes, disclosure becomes effective. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I should maybe better. clarify. Now, we have to complete our um, outreach programs. When we complete the outreach programs, because what we want to make sure is that we do not have an element of surprise. So we've done North Africa, we've done Southern Africa, and we're doing West Africa. The last that we will be doing is a combination of East and Central Africa. And we intend to complete this outreach programs. And, and for the outreach programs, you know, we're reaching out to civil society and we're reaching out to all of the ADB desk officers and other government representatives. When we have completed that, then we start putting the clauses in the agreement because there's no longer the surprise. We have provided um, the right type of information and it will be time to actually implement every um, part of, of, the, of the agreement because one of the, of the policy, one of the things we've learned is that if you really want to succeed, you have to make sure that the governments understand why it is that we're introducing this and why it is that we're putting in this new clause. And, and our colleagues in the legal department also for them, it is, it is critical for them to know that we have completed um, the awareness program and so um, there wouldn't be any element of surprise when they're negotiating with a new template of um, financing contract. Thank you. And, and thanks for raising that issue. <laughs> well, participants and panelists, I mean, thank you very much. It's been really very, very interesting, very interactive. Uh, unfortunately, we have to end here. Uh, we've gone way beyond our time, and that's only because you have been wonderful participants. You have raised all the pertinent questions, and we've had also an excellent panel uh, that have responded to all your questions. So I'd like to say thank you to Commissioner Cho, to Marilo, to Cecilia, and to Mr. Sawyer, and to all of you uh, for having uh, uh, participated in this session. Now, uh, remember that this is not over. Uh, we're continuing tomorrow, and uh, the whole week, actually. And uh, therefore, we'd like to see you back here tomorrow. I believe it's at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock. But in the meantime, I think that we will uh, show our appreciation to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. One last word. Um, because, uh, oops, oh, sorry, one minute. one minute. So sorry, Mike. Um, you know, since I, I am not going to be here for the rest of the session, I really would like to, on behalf of the African Development Bank, thank each and every single one of you. Um, a lot of you have come from different countries. It is not easy to stay in one room for the whole day and remain engaged. So you're investing a lot of your time and a lot of your effort for us and as an institution. I just want to let you know we appreciate it and we do not um, take this, um, I, I would say, we, 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 will, we do not take you for granted 
and our engagement with you, both our shareholders represented by the government and the people represented by civil society, our engagement with you, we believe, would even be stronger after this outreach. So thank you very much. One quick announcement to make regarding tomorrow's program. Uh, we are, as uh, mentioned by the panel just now, as a part of the outreach program, we are going to have a working dinner yesterday. Uh, yesterday, sorry. Tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. So we are having a working dinner tomorrow for the PIUs, so les agences d'exécution de projet, and uh, government agencies which are present here. To, give, to take you through the procedure of disclosure, just like the Vice President mentioned, about some of the requirements pertaining to government and undertaking that government must make in, uh, in relation to the uh, disclosure. So tomorrow we have a working dinner here in the same room here, at uh, I think starting at 7, 7.30, so, and we'll be sending you also emails uh, in that regard. So it's dedicated to PIUs, Agent d'Execution Projet, and government agency, donc le, les départements euh, gouvernementaux qui sont ici présents. Merci. And uh, tomorrow, yeah, we are starting tomorrow at 9, Lynn said, and any further information will be conveyed to you at the appropriate uh, channel. Thank you.